take your Bibles this morning and open up to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. If you're going to the book of Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin reading in verse 10, and we're going to go down through verse 12. The scripture reads here in this passage, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I spoke just a few times ago on the, the battle that we have against these principalities and powers and princes of the darkness of this world. There in verse 12 it says, it says, For we wrestle against powers. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but just to draw our thoughts back to it on a, on a daily basis, brethren, we wrestle against powers. There's, there's powers and spiritual wickedness that, that tries to attack our minds and our hearts, tries to elevate us to a place of anger and wrath or to provoke us to not follow after God. There's, there's a, a working force of evil, evil spirits that... Without the check of the Holy Spirit in our life, without the check of the faithful Christian who's evaluating things in light of God's Word, those evil spirits will deceive us. And it's a daily basis that we need to be wrestling against. I don't think there's a moment where we need to lay off our armor and lay it down on the side and say, I've got time to take ease. Because the very thought of that is spiritual wickedness. God's called us to daily fight, to never give up, to finish that course, to walk faithfully all the days of our life. But there's wicked power in this world. And my message this morning is not on that wicked power, but we feel it all around us. That's, my, that's just where I want us to start and consider about in, in civic government. There's wicked power in civic government. There's wicked power in the thoughts of man. There's wicked power in the forces of these principalities and, and stuff that we wrestle against. But go back to verse 10. It says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. There's no, there's no equality here. There's the power of the might of God and there's the power of the wickedness that's there. They're not equal in their power, brethren. Wickedness and evil is far less powerful than the power of the might of God. And so, it's a great admonition for us. And where I want us to turn our thoughts and hearts over to today when it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That's the power of the might of our Almighty God, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit that's at work in our hearts and our minds as we submit ourselves to God. Be strong in in the power of His might. Now, I'm not going to have you turn to these verses. I've got several listed here. I'm just going to read them very quickly for you. And just listen to it talk about the power of His might. In Psalms 147 it says, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. He has great power and His understanding is infinite. Meaning that there's no place that we can go. There's no situation that we'll deal with. There's no anger of the heart, there's no hurt and despair of the heart that God Himself does not understand and where His power cannot equip us for. Jeremiah 32, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? There is nothing too hard for our, the, the, the Lord that we serve because He is omnipotent, He is all-powerful in all things. In the book of Mark, chapter 10, it says, And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible. There are things that we cannot overcome, or that we cannot do, or that we cannot carry on our own. There are things in our lives, in our, in our generation, that it's impossible for us to be able to do. But, he goes on and says this, But not with God, for with God all things are possible. Amen. All things are within the power of God to be able to execute either judgment or grace, great mercy or great conviction. In all things, God holds all power for us. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, it says, talking about Jesus Christ, it says, Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, 
sat down <clears throat> on the right hand of the mighty on high, majesty on high. He upholds all things by the word of his power. We can just look at creation for just a moment. There's darkness. That's all there is. And God speaks. Let there be light. And there's light. By the power of his word, there's creation. There's life. There's joy. There's peace. There's goodness. There's the Garden of Eden. There's the established purposes of God. By the power of his word, he can foreknow and foreordain and make happen far into the future things that he intends before he even frames the world. Our minds can't understand that kind of power. But God has all power over us. Amen. That's a comforting place for us as a people of God. And in Ephesians 10 it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the power of His might. Now we cannot wrestle against the evil that's in this world according to our own power. Go back to the book of Zechariah. Go to Matthew and then back up two books from Matthew and you'll find the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 4. And I want to remind you there, we may feel confidence. We may feel overly confident at times. We're a strong people. We're a nation that we have great patriotism and, and pride and, and we have a history of winning wars and we're the most powerful nation. We have reason to think like that. But God puts us back perfectly in perspective here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4, go down to verse 6 with me. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Whatever we do as a nation, whatever I do as a husband, whatever you do as a Christian, it's not by your own might, and it is also not by your own power that you are able to do what God has called you to do or to have that walk as a Christian. It's by the power of God, by the power of His might, that we can think with the Word of God, that we can understand the things that we understand. It's by His power that we can stand strong as Christians. Now, consider that for just a moment. Think about, let's think about Paul in that as an example of that. How weak we are, that whenever we need to take a stand for righteousness, and nobody stands with us. It's easy for us in this flesh to want to kind of cower down to that and, and just kind of fade out and not take that stand because we're all alone in this world. And that flesh doesn't feel comfortable being all alone. We don't have the power within us to take that kind of strong of a stance. When God calls us to stand firm in the Word of God and yet everybody else has rejected us and abandoned us. But if we are looking to the power of God and we're standing in the power of God, we are able, not because we have our own might, or because we have our own strength, but because the power of God will equip you to take a stand for righteousness. If we think about us as a nation this morning, brethren, we need men and faithful men, men who are strong in the word of God, who will begin to stand against the unrighteousness and the wickedness of this world, who will wrestle against that spiritual wickedness and stand on what is right and what is good in the sight of God and according to his word, but the reason we don't see very men is because the ones who do try to stand in their own strength and they fall whenever there's hardship or there's confrontation or there's struggle. But the men who stand in the power of the Lord are the ones who hold strong because God equips and He sustains and He preserves. There's no power within us by ourselves. If you get nothing else out of this message this morning, take that with you. There is no ability and no power within you to be able to stand against those wiles of the devil. That's why he says, be strong in the power of his might, not in our own power. Now, Peter's an example of that. If you remember, there's a time where Peter says to Jesus Christ, I will never deny you. What do we know happens very quickly after that? We see Peter denying him three times. That rooster crows. And Jesus' eyes and Peter's eyes lock together. And Peter very immediately recognizes my power that I have when I said to Jesus Christ, I will never deny you. I have fallen a great distance away. 
But yet whenever days later when the day of Pentecost has come and he's standing before all those people, he stands up and the very people that are part of crucifying Jesus Christ, he preaches Christ and Christ crucified. He says that the Jesus who you crucified, he is our Lord and our King with great boldness but is no longer in his own power. Peter's not trying to take a stand in his own strength but rather the strength of the Lord. <clears throat> Go with me over to the book of Acts chapter 1. Let's take a look at some things there in the book of Acts. Someone in Bible study hour mentioned this this morning. I believe it was Brother Ham. <clears throat> there is a promise given to the people of God. There's a promise that was given to the apostles in their day. In Acts chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 4. We see this promise. It says in verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. The apostles are gathered together in Jerusalem as they've been instructed to do. And they're waiting for this promise that the Father had given them. And they're, I don't believe they're certain about what this promise is. They're not certain about what all is going to be happening because they've never experienced this kind of promise before in their life. But they're waiting there in Jerusalem for this promise. Go down with me to verse, uh, let's just pick up the next verse. So for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. That's the coming the day of Pentecost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost is going to happen on that day. Now, now go down with me to verse, verse 8. It says, but ye shall receive power. That's the power that's going to be placed on the apostles. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's the promise that the Father had given to those as they waited in Jerusalem. The promise of this power that's coming from the Father on the day of Pentecost and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's apostolic gifts that they have at that point. They're able to lay hands and and bring about healing. They're able to, to preach, and everybody in their own, their own languages hear them preach. They're able to, to uh, perform all kinds of miracles, to establish their authority. It demonstrates not in and of themselves, but in God. There is power in the establishment of the Christian church of that day, but the power does not come through how strong Peter has grown, or how strong John has grown, but the power comes through the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost. And while the apostolic gifts are over, that time of those gifts are over, the Holy Spirit continues with us to this day. It's the earnest of our inheritance as a people of God. And the Holy Spirit works in us that we might be able to stand strong in the power of His might. Remember, there's battles all over the building that people, families go through. Grief and despair and anger and frustration and if we wrestle against those things in the flesh, you're not going to stand strong in your own power because your power grows weak. Your power is faulty. It gives you a false sense of strength on yourself. But there is a power that's given to the people of God. And we can stand strong in that power, which is the power of His might, that's given to us through the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit that works in us even to this day. Go over a book to the book of Romans. Let's start in chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Let's look at verse 5. Verse, well, we've got to start in verse 3. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 3. It says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Now, there's a common phrase that we say, don't pray for patience. Because if you pray for patience, God's going to give you great tribulation. There's a reason for that, because that tribulation is what works patience. We don't want that kind of power to have patience in the midst of our tribulations, because we're afraid. Because when we think about that kind of tribulation, we think about our own strength, or our lack of strength, rather. But if we understand in the power of His might, and we pray, God, equip me. God, I, I believe, help my unbelief. 
God, I, I know, help, my, help me grow in a knowledge. God, I, I desire to serve and walk with you. Give me the spirit to walk in those things. With that comes all the trials and the tribulations that ought to come in the life and the heart of a child of God that it might purge away all that wood and hay and stubble, the things that keep us from truly serving God. And we avoid those things because we think that we're going to have to walk out those things in our own strength. But there's a power that God has given us, and it's in that power, the power of His might, that we can stand strong, and we can, in tribulation, grow in patience. And we can, in verse 4, and patience worketh experience, and experience hope. Now listen to verse 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. What is the Holy Ghost? It's that spirit of promise by which we have power as a child of God. What do we have the power to do? Verse 5 is to love. The first great commandment, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you know that mankind fails miserably at keeping that one commandment? Only by the grace of God and the power of His might are we able to love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second commandment is to love our neighbor even as ourselves. Do you know that we fail miserably at that? We love what's immediately in front of us at times if it's lovable or if we think they deserve love. And so we fail miserably at loving our neighbor often. But whenever we are able to love our neighbor as Christ has told us to love our neighbor, it's the power of the Holy Spirit working in us that we might be able to love our neighbor. Or we can get further away from that and think about the, the commandment to love your enemy. In the flesh, that's impossible to do. Because our enemies spitefully use us and they deceive and they hurt and they throw all kinds of darts and we wrestle against the spiritual wickedness that comes when the enemy is attacking. And we cannot stand strong in our own might when God's word commands us to love our enemy. Verse 5 says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us by that Spirit, that we might be able to stand strong in the power of His might. To love our enemy in such a way that they cannot hesitate or doubt there's something bigger going on in that individual than his flesh. Jesus spoke with great authority. And the people, when they heard it, they knew that was a different form of authority than what we've ever heard out of the scribes and the Pharisees. The Holy Spirit beginning to reveal the power that was there in Jesus Christ. And there is a love that we can love with, brethren, that we love with that kind of love that comes through the Holy Spirit. There's a power in that love that some are going to reject and they're going to hate you for that, that love. But others whom God is working on, whose Holy Spirit is working in, they're going to say there's something different about the love of that individual. And you're standing in the power of His might when you love that way. Go over to chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> How is it that we as Christians, just thinking about America for just a moment, how is it that we can take a stand? Don't you get weary in trying to stand for righteousness in this world that has turned its back on the basic common sense of mankind as definitely against the Word of God? Do we have to question whether or not a man is a man and a woman is a woman? In our culture today, there's all kinds of questions about that, and there's this concept of science that man has created that tries to declare something contrary than just common sense. Don't we get weary? We might as well just give up. That's what the flesh at times wants to do, but no, brethren, we can continue to stand strong when we stand strong in the power of His might. Romans chapter 15, go all the way down to verse 13. It says, And now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. What is our hope? That we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. What is our hope? Well, that's a whole other sermon series to really consider that. I'll summarize it by saying this. Our hope is Christ, who is victorious over all these things. And if we're following Christ, 
It doesn't matter how crazy the world gets. It doesn't matter how crazy and how, 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 how much the world rejects that common sense of things. If we follow Jesus Christ, we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and the hope that Christ has already gained the victory. It's not an empty hope, brethren. It's a fulfilled hope. A hope that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so we explore that just for a minute. The power of His might. We take that as a, I've used it as a nation already, let's take it as a church. How is it that a church is able to function the way we're supposed to function? In the power of His might. How is it that God adds, how is it that we grow the numbers of the church in attendance or in membership? Not by our own strength. Mankind can come up with all kinds of programs and projects and gimmicks and all those kind of things to try to think that we're, getting, we're growing the church. But the church that never grows in the power of our programs and gimmicks and strengths. It's in the power of God whenever He adds to the church those whom He sees to add to the church. It's in the power of His might. How is it that a church, if we're going to follow God's Word and the hard things that God's Word says, such as in 1 Corinthians, that whenever a brother is overtaken in a fault and they're non-repentant in that sin and the church is supposed to go to a place of exercising discipline with that individual. Listen, I want you to think about the wording of this. When it talks about that, it says, Turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the soul may be saved. Do you know how hard that is? That's, that's more powerful than us. The feelings. Oh, I don't want them to feel bad. I don't want them to hate God. The feelings are those things that we must wrestle with because of spiritual wickedness. But when we look and we stand strong in the power of His might, a church can stand on the Word of God, trusting and believing that when we follow God's Word, it yields the fruit that God says it's going to yield. And that we can stand firm in the power of His might and knowing that His Word is the only place that we have to stand. His Word is the only guide for how we're to function as a body of believers. His Word is the only instruction that we have for how a church is supposed to conduct itself. When we deviate from that, we're thinking there's power in somebody else or something else. When we let God's Word be the sole guide for our faith and practice, we're standing, in the, standing strong in the power of His might. I can flush that out even more. Stand strong in the power of His might, you husbands. I really should say it this way, you wives. I, I think the husbands are more miserable to live with than the wives. Wives are tender. Wives have great discernment if, a, if it's a godly wife. And husbands are busy and we, we get selfish and we get self-centered. And I don't know how many times throughout the year something as simple as this when my wife will call and ask bring home milk or something from the, from the store on the way home and I get home and she's like, did you have my bread? I ain't thought again about it. And she with grace and with dignity, all right, I'll run to the store and get that. It's hard being a spouse because you're married to a sinner. It's hard loving someone who sins against you. It's hard doing life together with a man or a woman who with all of your love can say some of the hardest things to you and make you feel miserable at times. It's hard that whenever you're doing life together as one flesh and those evil spirits come in and they attack and they try to create division and, and separation rather than the oneness that God's Word tells us that we ought to have. It's hard to do that. And we have so many divorces in this nation today because... Husbands and wives approach that marriage trying to stand in that marriage and that role as a husband or wife in their own strength. And you cannot do it. You will not be successful in your own strength. But whenever we stand strong in the power of His might, brethren, God can take a marriage that looks like it's hanging on by a thread and can completely restore it. God can raise up hope where we've lost hope. It's not in our power, but it's in His own power, in the power of His might. There's people in Scripture that whenever they stand in the power of His might, they have supernatural strength. Think about Samson for just a moment. Strongest man of the Bible, 
uh, the, the word records there. And so long as he followed God's commands, as long as he stood strong in the Lord, God gave him supernatural strength. Even at the end of his life, sitting his arms tied to those pillars and he pushing the pillars down so that in that final act, he was able to destroy more of the enemy at that one time than he had his whole life. That's the power of God in equipping him to be able to do what God had called him to do. King David, walking out on the battlefield between him and the Philistines, the giant Goliath, King or David, the boy who's out in the field watching the sheep for his father as a young shepherd and a bear and a lion come up. How is it that a young boy or a young man can stand on a battlefield and face great giants like lions and bears and, and a um, giant Goliath, and yet they overcome those by the power of their own hands, by a, a smooth stone in a slingshot. It's not possible because in our strength, we think that we have to have the AK-47s and the, the, the big weapons in order to fight those battles, but in the power of his might, a smooth stone can give great victory. I think of Gideon also. All these different things, all these different battles that's recorded in God's Word, it's a clear recording. God doesn't share His glory with anybody. Jonathan and his armor bearer go into battle against an army strong, and yet they put them in disarray and have a great victory that day. Not because Jonathan was so strong and so clever and so wise that he just knew what he was doing, but it was in the power of the might of Almighty God that he was able to be victorious. Brother, we wrestle against spiritual wickedness on a daily basis. Sometimes the big wrestle is just right here in our own heads, fighting against the anger and the selfishness and the pride and the fear and the grief. But it's worth fighting that battle. Do not let that flesh, do not let that spiritual wickedness take over your life because God has given us something far greater, brethren, he says, and finally, brethren, be strong in the power of God's might. Go with me back to the book of Acts, chapter 4. I'll close out with these passages. The book of Acts, chapter 4. Here in Acts, chapter 4, this is the the beginning of the Christian church that's being established for us, the history of the Christian church being start, uh, getting started is here in the book of Acts. And so we see the, the account of what those apostles and those early Christians went through as we read through the book of Acts. And here in chapter 4, let's begin in verse 7. It says, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Let me tell you what's going on now. The Pharisees, those religious leaders of that day, are having to deal with why a miracle has occurred in their midst. If you remember the story, Peter and John walk into the temple and there's a man that's lame laying there. And Peter looks at him and says, look, look at me. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the man's walking and leaping and praising God and and rejoicing in the Pharisees see this great miracle and they have no understanding of how this was possible. And so here they are in verse 7 and they ask this question, by what power or by what name have you done this? Well, is it medical science? Is it the power of the medicine that God's blessed man to create? That's not what happened in that passage of scripture. It's the power of Peter because Peter finally redeemed himself by not denying Christ on that beach, right? It's not in the power of Peter. Keep reading with me in verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Now that's, that's the indication. The Holy Ghost is given by promise. And that promise is that in the Holy Ghost there is great power. Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you. By what name and by what power have you done this? It's Jesus Christ. It's in the power of his might 
that that impotent man is walking. It's in the power, it's by the power of the might of Jesus Christ, brethren, that you and I are alive and have any measure of peace and joy in our hearts even this morning. Go ahead down to verse 31. Same chapter, but verse 31. Those Pharisees saw the power of God at work and they questioned it. They doubted it. They were trying to attribute it to something different. Peter tells them it's in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this, might, this, this great miracle was done. It's in his power. Then picking up verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness, evil deceptions. Brother, we wrestle on a daily basis against those things that God has told us to put on the full armor of God that you may be able to, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we need to put on that armor of God and we need to take that stand because of what Christ has done for us and what he's commanded for us to do as his followers. But we can never, in any shape, form, or fashion, take glory for any of the victory that happens because we do not stand in our own strength. We do not stand in our own power. We stand strong in the power of his might. And God gives the victory. Read verse 33 with me again. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There's a witness for us to have. There's a testimony for us to give today and tomorrow and the next day. Why do you have that hope and that joy in you? Why are you not living off in the street today? Why are you not conquered by that sin that you so, you so easily run back to whenever you're struggling some kind of way? Why are you not living in a stronghold of addiction or alcoholism? There's an answer to give to that. We can bear witness, brethren. And the witness that we need to bear is that I am able to stand in the power of His might. May the grace of our Lord help us to stand strong. Finally, brethren, be strong in the power of His might is my prayer for Christ's sake. When we walk